And uh, so take your Bibles, turn with me to the, go- to the book of Acts chapter 2. I started to say the gospel, really the Acts is like a gospel in that it is a continuation of the gospels of Christ, what happened when the church was born, the body of Christ on earth living out the call, the command, the commission, the charge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the title of this message from Acts 2 is Count me in. Count me in. Now, today uh, we hear a lot about metrics and analytics and counting in certainly the business world. Uh, If you have a business, you're probably into metrics and data and analytics because if you're not counting it, you're probably going out of business. Uh, In the sports world, Uh, You hear a lot about metrics, tendencies of the opposing team, the way you hit, the way the plays are run, tendencies of those teams. So today is is certainly the feel of coaching a game and and, 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 and coaching a team, but there's also the metric side, that that scientific side, if you will, and, and counting. So it's important. Uh, it, it's a political season, and both parties, Republicans and Democrats, I assure you, are looking at the data across the United States. And when it comes time to vote, and every person should vote, uh, then the count is going to go in. It's very important. Numbers count. And what is true in the sports world, business world, political world, is certainly true in the church, the New Testament church. What we have in Acts chapter 2 is a demonstration of the church being the church for every generation. It is a snapshot of who we are and what we are about. And certainly, counting and counting everyone all in. We uh, are interested not just in counting numbers, however, we are interested in making numbers count. Because it's never about the crowd, but it's always about the one, the one someone, the one everyone who needs Jesus. You need Christ in your life. So in the midst of a big crowd, you need to know that you are important to God enough that Jesus died for you, He rose again, and because God loves you, God's church loves you, every one. And though it is not about the crowd, it is always about the one, it is not about the only one, not just one, because there's always one more, amen? There's always one more, someone to reach with the message and the hope that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has blessed this congregation over its years of ministry, and we are now a big church, a very big church. Now, I know some people dislike big churches and say, well, big churches are impersonal, big churches are institutional, and on and on. I truly beg to differ by simply saying there is a reason a church is big. And the reason is the big heartedness, the generous heart of the people of God. So if a church grows, it grows for a reason. And we should never limit the growth that God wants to give to His church because everyone needs Jesus. And God is not willing that any would perish, but that all should come to repentance, faith in Christ. So who are we to say enough is enough? Who are we to say, well, we, we're stop, we're no, we don't care, we're not going to count, come what may. No, we are committed to getting as many people into the kingdom of God, therefore into His church as possible. So in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's God's Word, and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. This was a supernatural miracle church. 
And all who believed were together, big word here, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, that is publicly proclaiming the gospel and breaking bread in their homes, privately sharing Christ, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, watch this, added to their number. Somebody was counting. The Lord added to their number every day, day by day, those who were being saved. The New Testament church turned the world upside down. It was a Jesus revolution, a resurrection resolution. And as a result, God's church united and ignited together, brought countless lives to Christ. And to this day, to our generation, it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, begun and birthed by Christ himself that is a mighty, powerful weapon in the hand of God. When we are all in, when each of us can say, count me in. How so? I mentioned several ways, and I would encourage you to either write these in the margins of your Bible or to break, you know, write some notes. And let me just challenge you at the beginning of the year. Here's a good new discipline or habit that many of you could begin. And that is, number one, bring your Bible to church. Now, if you don't have a Bible, we can help you get a Bible. In fact, we'll give you a Bible today if you want one. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But um, uh, there's a Bible in the pew rack. But I want you to bring church. I want you to bring your Bibles to church. And also, I want you to encourage you to take notes on the messages. And not just because I'm saying it or Jared or someone else is saying it, but because we remember the things that we write and you're engaged in the message. So I want you to listen, I want you to hear, but I also want you to retain. So let me just encourage you to take notes on the message. And so here here are the points that I'm bringing to you today. Number one, count me in membership. Count me in membership. Now, clearly, the church was together, they were in the church, and they were in the church because they were converted. So what I'm talking about when I speak of the church is a converted membership. That is, not everyone who is a member of a church is a saved person. We know that. In fact, there are many, many people, unfortunately, probably millions of people whose names are on a church roll, but who do not know Christ personally. You're in a church because of cultural reasons or or personal reasons or family reasons of some kind, but you're not in the church because of salvation in Christ. When you back up just a little bit to see who constituted the church, the Christians who formed the church, Peter had preached a great message on the day of Pentecost. Uh, full of the Holy Spirit. He preached of Christ, the cross, the resurrection. And the Scripture says that the people were stabbed, those who listened. They were from all over the world. They would gathered there for a great religious feast, and they heard the gospel, and they were stabbed to the heart. They were convicted of their sin. And because they were convicted of their sin, they said, what should we do? And Peter, the great preacher, said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of, the sin, of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And so they did that. And on that day, because they came to Christ, they were added to the church. They were counted into the church. 3,000 of them became members of the church. Now, when you are born again, you are and then a member of the family of God, and therefore the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church is like a family. It's not so 
much an organization, of course, that you join, but a family that you share. It's a life that you share with other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when, when you become a believer, you are then a member of the church, Big C. Jared Stevens last night in his message on Saturday. We have a great Saturday service. You may want to choose to attend. But uh, the fact is that he spoke of church Big C, that is the worldwide global body of Christ. Uh, used to be called the invisible church. In other words, this vast body of believers, past, present, and future, who are in the church, big C. But most of the time in the Scriptures, it doesn't talk about the church, big C, but as Jared noted, little c, that is local congregations. For every time the worldwide body, big church, worldwide is mentioned, 25 plus times the local church is mentioned in the Bible. And the Bible was written to local churches and local congregations. But the early church, clearly they had an organization. They had pastor elders. They had deacons who served. Uh, Members of the church were mentioned, those who served the church. So the church formed into the family of God. You are a member of God's royal family. And it's going to go a lot better for you than it's going for the royal family in England right now. If you're keeping up with that story, what is Prince Harry thinking? I don't know. But you can never leave the family of God. You may want to sometimes, but you are a part of God's eternal family, secure in Christ. You are a member. And because you are a member of the family of God, you ought to be a member of God's church local body of believers, spiritual family. Should a Christian be a member of a local church? All caps, a bunch of exclamation points, yes, yes. You should identify with Christ and His church. Everyone who was believing on that day when the church was united together, also was baptized as a testimony of their faith. And every believer should be baptized by immersion. That's what the word baptism means. You shouldn't be baptized in some way and then added to the church later. You should come to Christ, you should be baptized, and then you belong to the church. So we believe, we're baptized, we belong Uh, to the church. If you've not been baptized, I would encourage you to do so according to the Scripture as soon as possible. But become a member of the church, a converted membership and a committed membership. We're not looking here at Prestonwood for mere joiners, like you would join a club or an organization. But committed Christians, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are saying, count me in membership. Count me in as a part of this local New Testament congregation. Not on the fringes, not floating here and there, not just being a religious consumer or absorbing religious uh, uh, content online, but no, a member active, passionate about God's church, about your church. Count me in membership, not casual. We take seriously membership in the church, and so should you. It is accountability, it is activity, and much, much more. Do not forsake, the Scripture says, the assembling of yourselves together. Be gathered in God's church. Secondly, count me in discipleship. Count me in discipleship. At that little frame, that paragraph, when it talks about the church in Acts 2, it says, and they continued or they were loyal, they were devoted to the apostles' doctrine. Now, the apostles 
were teaching the Word of God. They didn't have Bibles like we have them today. Scripture was written on parchments and there were very few copies. So what they had were the Jewish Scriptures and also the teachings of Jesus that the apostles were remembering and God revealed to them. Jesus told them, He said, I will lead you and show you all the truth. So these apostles, what are they teaching? They're teaching the words of Christ. They're teaching the way of Christ. They're teaching God's Word, how to live according to Jesus. And these believers, therefore, were learning the Word of God. That's a big part of church. And every person should say, count me in discipleship, because they didn't just get baptized and go away, but they got together, they gathered together, and they continued steadfastly. I love that word. They were passionate about it. They were in the Word, and the Word got in them. And that's what happens when we get in the Word. There's some great John 3, there's some great 316s in the Bible. John 316s is one, one that you know. But here's another one, Colossians 3.16, where it says, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. And it goes on to say teaching and admonishing and speaking together in psalms and hymns. In other words, sharing the Word of God together. We are people of the book. Preston Wood. It is the Word of God that forms us and frames our lives because we're not only here to be learning the Word, but living the Word. And so what we do is teach and preach Jesus Christ and the Word of God, for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And that's why we say bring your Bibles. That's why we say study your Bibles. Have a daily time of devotion in which you are searching the Scriptures. To get the Word of God alive in you. May I say something very clearly? The Bible is God's inerrant, infallible Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. This book is the living, eternal Word of God. And as long as this church exists, by God's grace and to His glory, we will be preaching and teaching the Word of God. This is our message. You don't have to wonder, you don't have to worry when you come to this church, whether you're not, you're going to hear the Word or not, because we're going to get the Word of God in our lives. We, we're going to continue in this. We're going to keep going and growing in the Word of God. We have, therefore, not only preaching services that are built around teaching Scripture, the messages. We're going to be, again, a series in February on, from the book of Ephesians. Great, one of my favorite New Testament letters and books. We're going to call it More, because it's all about the much more that God has provided for us in Christ, our identity. So we'll be teaching through Ephesians, and that's the way we preach and teach here. But beyond this pulpit, uh, and beyond uh, what happens in here in, in the big room, all these other rooms here we have designated and dedicated to teaching the Word of God in our Bible fellowship classes, whether it is children, and we're teaching the smallest children God's Word, our students who are in student ministry right now. A couple of years ago, we made the decision we're going to take our students from this room, this worship service, and they're going to have a worship service, a venue. We miss them. We bring them in as often as we can. But our students right now are under the sound and teaching of God's Word under our student leadership. Uh, But my point is for the adults, the adult Bible fellowship ministry. This is our teaching ministry. For you old schoolers, that's Sunday school. But we call it adult Bible fellowship. And every member of our church should be a faithful, active member in a small group, an adult Bible fellowship class. How many of you are active in an adult Bible fellowship class? Can I see your hands? Hold them up. All right. Thank you very much. God bless you. And to those of you who did not lift your hands, shame on you. Seriously. 
We should all have a hunger, not for less, but for more of the Word of God. And it is in those, in a very practical and personal and pastoral way, it's in the, our Bible fellowship classes, we call them fellowship, that people will pray with you and for you when you've got a crisis, when you've got an issue, you can pray with others, you can help, you can serve, you can minister so much. I would dare say most of the service that rolls out of Prestonwood comes through our Bible fellowship classes. This is our, uh, this is our infrastructure, if you will, and, and it's out of our classes. And so you need to be in Bible fellowship. And I'm just challenging you to find a class. You can go to Guest Central. You can go to Information Desk, and we'll tell you about the classes. And I'm just telling you, it will bless your life, and you will bless the lives of others when you are fully engaged. So I'm saying, count me in discipleship. We have many tools for discipleship, ministries, and all the rest, but the core, the key, are those Bible fellowship classes. They don't all meet on Sunday. Some meet at other hours during the week. So that's an option as well. So number one, count me in membership. Count me in discipleship. Thirdly, count me in fellowship. Mentions the word chapter two here in fellowship. It says in verse uh, 44, they, were, they who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to anyone who had needs. You see this ministry that's taking place. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. In other words, they, in verse 2, also 42, also mentions the teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. That reference is most likely uh, the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread. It could mean just the breaking of bread, the house and house, the fellowship meals. Uh, either way, it works, doesn't it? We have the Lord's Supper together, remembering as Jesus commanded us our, our Lord's death and, and His promise to us of redemption. We do that regularly in our worship services, and we do it each month at our first Wednesday service, which is a church service. It's a body life service. Say, when is first Wednesday service? It's the first Wednesday <laughs> of every month. And, and, and we gather, and, and, and most every time we share the Lord's Supper together. So we should have this attitude, I can't wait to get more. I can't wait to get more church, not, not less, not less time with God's people and with the fellowship of His people. You know, we have designed even our buildings to be a conduit for community contact for community. And the small groups, the Bible fellowships that I mentioned, it takes a, you know, the thing that we work at at a big church all the time is making it smaller. I mean, the, the, big, the big numbers are great, but in, in great groups, and we gather, it's a movement. We love that, but also to break it down so that we know one another. As Jeff Young told me before this service, in our Bible fellowship, Jeff heads all discipleship and small groups at Prestonwood. It's a huge job. Pray for him and his staff and his team. But he was telling me, we don't want anyone in our church to stand alone. And I've watched so many times if people have gone through illness or sickness or death. I just saw it this week, the prayer of God's people at a funeral and the support of God's people when, when that crisis hits or that death comes to the family or all those things that happen us when a child runs away, all those things. If you're in a group, you know, you have the opportunity to share, to be transparent, to work on your own life. So much that I could say, but it's fellowship. It's being with God's people. It's being together. You know, a team wins together. When they're not together, they lose. You know, you win together or you lose separately. I can tell you who's going to win the national championship tomorrow night. I can tell you who's going to win the Super Bowl here in a couple of weeks. You know who it is? the team that plays together. Because the team that doesn't, even one, if one person is not carrying out their assignment on the field, you lose. And many churches are losing today because they are not together. There is so much division in God's church among God's people today. And 
we need to get together as God's church. And I so appreciate the unity, even with the midst of great diversity in our community and our church community. It is our unity, it is our togetherness that makes us triumphant. And one of the great blessings of being your pastor all these years is to see that unity, that sweet spirit of love that keeps us together and triumphant for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's fellowship. You know, somebody said fellowship is two fellows on the same ship. But what it really means is we, have, we share life together, we share love together, we share labor together. You want to you, you know what real fellowship is? It's not just hanging out and drinking coffee together. But real, you can have fellowship in that. But real fellowship is when you get with a band of believers and you start sharing your faith, you start serving others with another group of people. And whether it's setting up chairs or working in a parking lot or working in the child children's ministry or you name it, all these 45 or 50 different kinds of designated ministries we have, you get with a group, you get in the choir and, and, and worship and sing together. That's, that's like revival uh, every week when they rehearse. I'm telling you, fellowship is sharing a common life, a common load, a common love. And when we do that, when the fellowship of God's people is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Amen. So count me in membership. Can you say that? Count me in discipleship. I am knowing and growing in the Word of God. I want to be in the church. If you're in a church, you ought to attend it, you ought to defend it, and you ought to extend it. And there's one final thing. Count me in stewardship. Stewardship. When you read the Scripture here, it says, did you get that part of the passage when it says they sold all their possessions? And they met the needs of one another in the congregation. I've heard some people look at that and say, see, that's socialism, that's communism. No, it isn't. First of all, it's church-centered, not government-centered. Number two, it was voluntary, not coerced. And number three, it's all about Jesus, not all about somebody else. So this isn't common. This is the church, in a, and it was temporary. That's the other thing. They didn't do this the rest of the life of the church on earth. It was, there was a time, but the point is they, they, they recognize this one fact. Everything we have belongs to Jesus. All we have belongs to God. So they just gave it and they pooled their resources to minister to one another and to advance the mission of Christ in their community. So God, that's stewardship. I love the phrase here when it says they had favor and they had, verse 46, right at the end of it, generous hearts, generous hearts. I am so grateful for the generosity of this church over the years and the people. When I say church, that means you, the people. So many, many, many of you have been so very generous. I mean, you look around these buildings, um, bought and paid for in full because of the grace of God, the goodness of God, and the people of God who sacrificed. Amen. People who, before many of you were here, gave and gave and gave some more. You know that. These this great church, these facilities just didn't pop up without the sacrifice and the generosity of people. Our North Campus say the same, Espanol. And then the millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that we have invested in the mission of Christ here and around the world, people's lives. Thank you for being generous to that and for that. And I thought of a lot of ways that I could soften what I'm about to say. So I'm going to say it as quietly as I can. But many, many, many are not generous. I don't know any other, any other way to put it. Do you have a generous heart? Are you giving, beginning with your tithes? That's our only financial program. It's our plan. 
is just to obey God by bringing the first tenth of your income and give beyond the tithe. The tithe is, is the It's the floor, not the ceiling of Christian stewardship. It's the starting place. It's kindergarten. Paul said, grow and excel in this grace also. So as your pastor, because I love you, I'm counseling you to be a generous giver because that's the heart of God. And to say, Lord, everything I have belongs to you. And as you lead me according to your word and by your spirit, I will give with a generous heart. And when that happens, when, it, when people say, count me in membership, count me in discipleship, count me in fellowship, and count me in stewardship, look at the last part of verse 47. Notice what happens. They're praising God. They're happy. They're loving life. They've got favor. There's my word for the year. Favor. Favor with all the people. The church was inviting. It was winsome. Everyone was welcomed in. And can I say that this church welcomes everyone. God is bringing the world to us. What has divided the church in so many ways across political lines, across denominational lines, across uh, racial lines, across socioeconomic lines. May God tear down every single wall that separates the people of God from one another. And may God unite us and may everyone know you are welcome in the family of God. May God give us favor with the people in our community. And you know, God sent us some wonderful people. Our Preston Wood Espanol is, you know, 19 or 20 nations are represented. Our Persian ministry, the Iranian uh, ministry in our church, it's a great class. And I was just speaking, Mike Buster actually was speaking to them, was telling me, uh, because I wanted to know, I said, how are our Persian Christians here at Preston Wood doing in view of the, of, of the, of the assassination, the killing of, uh, of the terrorists over there? And thank God for our military and a president that will stand up against the terrorists of the world. That guy had to go. He's a bad guy. But I ask, I ask, uh, I ask uh, the Persian Christians, I say, how are you doing? I mean, how do you feel about all this? And number one, they were just saying, we are so glad that guy's gone. He's terrorized our people. Did you know that more Persian, they're Persian, Iranian, Iranians are coming to Christ in the last 20 years than the previous 2,000 years uh, in Iran and in the, in the Middle East. They're giving up on their false religion and coming to faith in Jesus Christ, many, many. And, and they were just telling, telling me, we, we stand with, our, with America, we stand with our country, but they were saying, just pray for our friends and our family in Iran. And thank God for the courage of people in Iran who are standing up in these days, many losing their lives. PowerPoint partners with Iran Alive, and we are on television via the internet in Iran, and we have a tremendous response. And again, that's just something you may not know, but when you're giving, you're giving to support the gospel going behind the curtain there in Iran and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing the opportunities we have. Some watching online around the world right now. It's truly incredible. So our goal is to reach our community and beyond with the gospel. And what was happening here, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Every single day people were coming. It was every day evangelism. And you know, we see that actually here. We see people coming to Jesus every single day to God be the glory. But we've been talking about counting and I'm wrapping up. But let's do some counting on the local church because I told you they counted numbers. And the church was exploding. You ought to be a part of a growing church. Not every church is growing. I know some churches are in areas that are non-growth areas and had the same people in town for the last 100 years and all that. But if you're in a community where there are people to be reached, be in a growing church, wherever God leads you. Because we want to be a part of a Jesus revolution, a dynamic, 
compassionate church. So let's do some counting. I mean, you can start with just the 11 disciples. You know, they lost one with Judas, replaced him with Matthias in the book of Acts. So there were 11 standing on the mountain, Mount Olivet, uh, outside of Jerusalem. I've stood there many times. We'll be standing there again in just a few months with our trip where Jesus ascended and gave them the Great Commission. And, and there were 11. And then in Acts 1.15, look at what Acts 1.15, it's on the screen. There were 120 of them in an upper room. So the church is burst on the day of Pentecost. There's 120. Peter preaches this dynamic message. And then in Acts 2, 41, it says 3,000 were converted. Again, somebody counted them. Somebody cared enough to say, oh, man, well, we had a lot of people saved. No, one, two, three, four, five, six. They counted 3,000. That's a pretty good first sermon for Simon Peter, wouldn't you say? And then in 247, as we just noted, in the days and weeks that followed, people were coming to Christ every single day. And then in chapter 4, verse 4, it tells us that they had another outdoor service and 5,000 men were converted to Christ. It's noteworthy that the men were numbered. So when you add in, you assume that the wives and children were there, and many of them. So most Bible scholars, I mean, just, just add it up in your head, you can guesstimate this one, but if there were 5,000 men, let's say there were another 10,000 wives, women, and children, and grandparents, and grandma, you know, they all come to Christ. So now you've got what? 15, 20, 25,000 people in the first week or two of the church is exploding. And then in, in, in Acts chapter 5, verse 28, look at that one, Acts chapter 5 and verse 28, they were being accused, the apostles, of preaching the gospel. They said, we told you not to teach in the name of Jesus. And yet, what happened? Acts 5, 28, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man Jesus' blood upon us. Now the whole city is saturated with the message of Jesus. Everyone's hearing about Jesus. You couldn't go anywhere without the name of Jesus being, being preached. And these adversaries said, you fill this city with the teaching of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what I'm challenging us to do. To fill our city, to fill our communities to take the gospel first to Jerusalem, to take the gospel home, to bring the gospel home. It starts here. It starts now. And then to the ends of the earth. But there's more. Acts 6, 7. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied First it was adding, the Lord added to the church daily. Now the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and even a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. B.H. Carroll, important name in Christian history, Baylor University initially, and, and then the founder of Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, great Bible scholar from the 19th century, estimated that in the first six months of the church, there were over 65, 70,000 new believers and members of that church. Others like Campbell Morgan, a great Bible teacher, suggest even more, upwards to 100, maybe even more. The point is thousands and thousands and thousands of people were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. No wonder they said the church has turned the world upside down. This is our calling. This is Christ's command. It doesn't stop. And we will never stop preaching the gospel, sharing Jesus. A couple of weeks, we're going to have a major focus on personal evangelism, how to share your faith. We always speak of this, and we're going to keep training and keep together in getting the gospel out. Everybody has friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors that need Jesus. That's called frangelism. You ever heard of frangelism? F-R-A-N-gelism. Friends, relatives, associates neighbors who need Jesus, and someone you know needs to know Jesus. 
And so we're going to be trained. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep growing. Again, who gives us the right to say stop when God wants the whole world to hear the gospel? That God is not willing to anybody. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell, and certainly we shouldn't either. So that's why we're going to stay focused. I know 2020 is a big year for a lot of reasons. And of course, it's an election year. And there's going to be a lot of news and a lot of noise in an election year. We certainly, as Christians, should speak to the public square. In fact, we have one of our ministry teams that is cultural impact. We talk about the issues, pro-life, pro-marriage, the cultural issues, beyond justice as well, and prison reform. We've talked about a lot of things as Christians over the last several years. And you ought to vote, and you ought to vote your values, vote your Bible. We never tell anybody how to vote here. We just simply say, vote the principles of the Bible. People know how to vote if they'll pay attention to God's Word. And, but not only national election, but the local elections and our state elections, these are all very, very important. And you need to vote. You know, 25 million evangelical Christians didn't vote in the last election. That's sad. Um, really sad because somebody spilled blood for your right to vote. To just get yourself to the polls and vote your conscience, vote your convictions, vote your candidates. So yes, we're going to encourage that. We're going to get out the vote. But let me assure you of one thing as always, Preston Wood. We're not going to get caught up in all the chaos because as my friend Sammy Rodriguez tells us, it's not the agenda of the donkey or the lamb. We're on the, or the donkey or the elephant. It's the agenda of the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to stay laser beam focused on doing what the church has called us to do, and that's preach the gospel and bring people to Jesus Christ. Because that's the only thing ultimately that's going to save any country, including America. The answer for America is not a political answer, it is a spiritual awakening. And that starts in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God's people say, count me in, count me in. So would you bow your heads with me in prayer, every head bow. I just want to pray for you as your pastor. Would you pray right now, Lord, count me in, in membership, in discipleship, growing in my faith, in the fellowship of being a friend and being family in your church. Count me in, Lord, in stewardship, that I would be a faithful, generous giver. Count me in in bringing others to you. Pray like this, Lord, I don't want to be a religious consumer. Lord, I want to be your servant. I want to say, here am I, Lord, send me. I want to be a part of the church. I want to go and grow with my church. Lord, show me how and where I can serve. Would you pray that? Lord, show me how and where I can serve. And then let me ask you on a personal note, would you pray for your pastor? Would you pray for me? Would you pray for Jared, our teaching pastor? Would you pray for our preaching team, our pastoral team, our North Campus pastor, Connor Bales, Preston Wood Espanol, Gilberto Cardera? Pray for those of us who preach, Neil, so many others. But pray for us. Pray that we would be pure in heart. Pray that we would be committed to you. Lord God, may it be true. I need you. We need you, church, to pray for us. Pray for the deacons of this church, wonderful, godly, dedicated deacons. Pray for their wives, their families. Pray for the adult and children and student Bible fellowship leaders. Pray for your class, your group. If you're not in one, pray that God would lead you to one. 
pray that our classes, our groups, would always be filled with love and unity and commitment to you and growing and sharing the faith. Pray for our volunteers, scores and scores, hundreds of them, Lord, those who serve children's ministry, those who serve in the parking lots, those who serve in Main Street, those who serve in the choir, those who serve in the ministries. Lord, we pray for them. And then one more time, pray, Lord, count me in. And then take steps, starting today, to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.